So I will talk about some of our work in the fields of quantum metrology and quantum technologies. Right. Uh, the rapid technological changes during the last couple of centuries are usually described in terms of these four industrial revolutions. This morning we heard about some aspects of digitalization. Quantum technologies are another kind of technologies that are also contributing to the fourth industrial revolution, which is presently ongoing. Quantum technologies are expected to have a major impact on computing, communication, sensing, and various other industries. These last two industrial revolutions were made possible in large part by the development of quantum physics. Namely, quantum physics provides us with the understanding of material properties, and this has enabled inventions of the transistor and the integrated circuit, which in turn made possible mass production of digital electronic computers. This was followed by miniaturization, uh, which has been the main trend in the semiconductor industry during the last half a century. This plot is called Moore's law. It is an empirical law stating that the number of transistors per chip doubles roughly every 18 months or so. We can see here that during 1970s, there was a couple of thousand of tr transistors per chip, and nowadays there are tens of billions. This has resulted from um, continual improvements in uh, microfabrication techniques by making transistors smaller, more of them can be put on a chip, and that increases the computing power of electronic chips. Nowadays, electronic chips are widely used from handheld devices to these uh, server farms that are even built in Arctic Circle due to required cooling. In all of these applications, uh, the main function of the transistor is to operate as an electronic switch. So it can either let the electric current, elect, electric current through or it can block the flow of current. And these two states represent two binary states, one and zero of digital electronics. And so these devices are at the heart of what is called digital or information age that we live in. A uh, critical element of the transistor is uh, maybe here shown just as a line under this um, uh, yellow or green um, box. So that's a gate electrode. So under that gate electrode, there is a, a layer of insulating material. And the purpose of that material is to keep electrons inside the transistor, inside the so-called electronic channel. However, with miniaturization, also that layer gets proportionally thinner. And when it gets thin enough, electrons can leak through that layer. And they do so by the process of quantum mechanical tunneling. This is inherently quantum phenomenon. We don't have analog in classical physics. If I throw a ball at the wall, it just bounces back. But when that ball gets very small, then uh, like here we consider electrons, due to their wave nature, they can pass through a barrier without damaging that barrier. And so that process renders the conventional transistor unusable. On the other hand, it's possible to use this same phenomenon to design of tunneling, to design new kinds of transistors. And that's what we have done together with colleagues in Japan. We have made single electron tunneling transistors and other devices. This is example of our single electron memory device. And below, I just sketched the main operating principle. Near the middle of this device, there is a small metallic island of a nanometer length uh, that is separated from an electrode by insulating material for which electrons can tunnel. And the purpose of this island is basically just like serves the purpose of a box. So by operating this device, we can put one electron into the box that represents state one. When we remove it, box is empty and that represents state zero. So here we use one electron to represent one bit of information. And that is the ultimate goal of miniaturization in digital electronics that I have shown on the previous slide. Around the same time when we were working on this device, another team in Japan produced the device on the right. This device has essentially the same electronic circuit diagram as our memory, but they used superconducting material. Uh, and superconductors are characterized by the fact that they have no resistance to the flow of current. This is a consequence of self-organizing of electrons at low temperatures in these materials. Namely, they spontaneously get paired in so-called Cooper pairs. And so in their case, again, they have a, a small box. When they put a pair of electrons into the box, that's state one. When they remove it, box is empty, and that represents state zero. However, significantly in the superconducting case, it's possible to put a pair of, of electrons into a superposition 
whereby that pair is simultaneously inside and outside the box. Superposition is another inherently quantum phenomenon. Again, we don't have analog in, in classical physics. But then this represents a qubit or a quantum bit. So that's a unit of quantum information. So these systems can be in states one or zero or one and zero at the same time. This was the first realization of a qubit in electronic circuit and that opened the door of, of, for the quantum information processing, a new area of science that is uh, currently very active. This, uh, this is the smallest quantum computer because it contains only one qubit. Currently the state of the art is shown on, on these um, images. On the left is a Google Sycamore processor. It has 53 qubits and it was used to solve a problem in a couple of minutes and it is calculated that it would take about 10,000 years on a top supercomputer. On the right is another processor made by a team in China. Uh, it was used to solve another problem, again in a couple of minutes, and it is calculated it would take billions of years on a supercomputer. These achievements are called quantum supremacy milestones. They are demonstrations of solutions to problems that uh, on quantum computers that are not feasible to consider on classical computers. These are so-called special purpose quantum computers. Uh, qubits here are wired just in a particular way to consider just one type of a problem. Goal is to produce general purpose quantum computer that can be programmed just like what we do nowadays with classical computers. These uh, general purpose quantum computers are expected to help solve some major problems from designing medical drugs to solving some issues related to climate change. These types of, of computers um, will also pose certain risks to secure communications, for example, and um, because they can easily, if, 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 if a general purpose quantum computer has a large enough number of qubits, they can easily break all the existing cryptographic protocols. So that's one of the reasons that security agencies around the world are interested in these fields. And we have been collaborating with the Defense Technology Agency and with them, we participate in assignment uh, with a technical cooperation program where we consider some topics from quantum technologies. I have mentioned these superconducting junctions due to their applications in quantum computing, but they play important role in metrology. And I'll mention uh, one application here for DC voltage standard. Um, there are uh, three kind of basic units in um, or basic quantities in electrical standards. These are voltage, current and resistance. And I'll just briefly go through the three corresponding quantum standards. Uh, these types of junctions are also called the Josephson junctions after Brian Josephson, who was the first to theoretically analyze some of their properties and he was awarded Nobel Prize for that work. So when we have a superconducting junction that is irradiated with microwaves, then the output voltage as a function of the current uh, flowing through the junction is displayed on, on this plot here. We can see these clear steps. They are actually characteristic of all quantum standards. Um, these quantum devices are in some sense analogous to, to electrons in atoms where they can occupy only a discretized set of energy levels, similar to say books on a bookshelf. And so here, th these are not energy levels, these are called uh, quantum locking ranges. So for a certain uh, interval of input uh, quantity, output is fixed at some, some value. In this case, so we are talking about voltage. So these steps uh, can be expressed in terms of fundamental constants. This is the logo of the SI, the International System of Units that was introduced in 2019. And so at the core is a set of exactly defined values of fundamental constants, and then they are used to um, define units of all physical quantities. Output from a single Josephson junction is in a millivolt range. So to increase this, uh, one produces arrays of, of serial uh, connection uh, of Josephson junctions of, of thousands of them. Nowadays, uh, there are chips with hundreds of thousands of these junctions. And this is a typical um, chip layout. MSL has several of these. And um, so originally, uh, Lori Christian has introduced this standard and work on um, uh, providing voltage standard, um, primary voltage standard for New Zealand. And now there's also uh, Tim Lawson is, is working on that. Uh, this is a, a device that we have proposed and theoretically analyzed. And that was the 
basis of a multinational project that was funded by European Commission. This device is called single electron pump. Uh, it has basically two of these uh, boxes and then electrons are made to, to hop between uh, these uh, boxes and they uh, go through, through electronic circuit one by one. And so here at the output, we can see these characteristic um, flat steps output of, of um, such quantum uh, devices. And so in this case, the output quantity is electric current. And the third um, quantum standard that I mentioned is standard of resistance. It's based on uh, quantum Hall effect. So here one uses these so-called semiconducting heterostructures uh, such as gallium arsenide, on top of that is aluminum gallium arsenide, and, and the interface is formed so-called two-dimensional electron gas. And then when that uh, structure is placed in perpendicular magnetic field and one sends a current in longitudinal direction, then the transverse voltage as a function of the magnetic field is shown as this top curve. Again, we, we can see these characteristic steps. And when one divides the voltage by current, one obtains resistance in terms of fundamental constants. And so that's a quantum standard of resistance. And this is a typical chip layout. Um, uh, Keith Jones introduced this standard to MSL and uh, nowadays uh, Mari and Tima are still uh, working with these devices. Currently an active area of research in metrology is consideration of graphene. That is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms. They form this hexagonal lattice. And the reason this material is of interest is because it displays quantum Hall effect even at room temperature. So on the previous slide, I have shown quantum Hall effect um, uh, characteristic of um, semiconducting heterostructures. These materials require very low temperatures, liquid helium, so around minus 270 degrees Celsius. Um, and it is easier to operate at higher temperatures. Furthermore, when graphene has these ripples, then electrons behave as if they are in a strong magnetic field. So there is a potential of designing chips based on graphene that can uh, provide quantum standard of, of resistance, perhaps even at room temperature with no magnetic field, so very easy to use. And this is just one example of a trend in metrology that's called NMI on a chip or National Metrology Institute on a chip, where the goal is to produce simplified quantum standards and then distribute them throughout the industry. So in that way, um, say on the factory floor, one would uh, be able to, to have access to uh, standards of quantities that are currently available only at National Metrology Institutes. We have been working on various uh, materials that are related to graphene. One example are carbon nanotubes. Uh, these are cylindrical shape. One can think of them as, as uh, folding seamlessly graphene. Uh, in, oops, into a tube and uh, um, in, into a cylinder. And so the ones that we have been working with, they have diameter one nanometer and they can be several micrometers long. This is a, a chip that we have developed with um, uh, our colleagues at Osaka University. So there are some gold electrodes and in the middle is a small gap that is bridged by a single wall carbon nanotube. So we have achieved, this is a, uh, transistor operation, there is a current flowing or current being blocked. And uh, we investigated uh, their sensing properties here with Jeremy from humidity standards. Uh, in, in general, this area is, is area of quantum sensing. People are interested in developing sensors that can detect minute amounts, for example, single molecules of some dangerous gases or explosives. Uh, also variations of environmental conditions, um, temperature, pressure, variation of gravitational field, <laughs> all based on, on uh, various atomic properties. Uh, there is a major shift in, in the field of material science. Uh, material science uh, has his historically been heavily empirically based. People have over time uh, discovered new materials or changed the properties of materials by trial and error. And this is a very slow process. So nowadays, all the materials that are known are just a small fraction of the possible materials that can be made. On the other hand, uh, in recent years, there has been a considerable advancement in computational techniques. 
So nowadays, a number of materials are discovered computationally. And so one example is silicene, that is a single atomic, uh, um, single atomic layer of silicon. And so it, it is shown here. We have investigated some properties of uh, uh, silicene under strain. This is a new field of electronics called strain-tronics. So for all of these materials, uh, we have been uh, working on Mahuika, that is a New Zealand supercomputer. And this is a, just one last uh, typical example of a research project in, in quantum metrology. Um, this is a device that was um, uh, developed at Aalto University in Finland. It's called single electron turnstile. Um, it's similar to the pump that I mentioned before. This device also uh, passes electrons one by one through a circuit. And um, so that's the desirable process to, to transfer electrons one by one. However, under certain conditions during the operation of the device, also pairs of electrons are transferred. These are Cooper pairs that I have mentioned in relation to quantum computing. So in that example, uh, in quantum computing, we are interested to manipulate and transfer Cooper pairs. But here, these are error processes. So instead of one electron, one extra is transferred. So th this is not desirable process. And <clears throat> uh, this operation of, of this device is actually interplay, interplay of the three quantum effects that I have described, Josephson, single electron transport, and quantum hole. And we have shown that by using the magnetic field, one can suppress uh, these processes. Basically, when there are two electrons, they interfere, and magnetic field can destroy that interference. And magnetic field doesn't uh, influence single electron transport. So by using magnetic field, one can suppress the errors and in that way increase the accuracy of this device. And so basically, uh, that's kind of example of what we continually try in metrology. So on one hand, we um, constantly try to increase the accuracy of our description of physical phenomena, and then that is used to increase the accuracy of primary standards. So, uh, and then I will just mention, I have mainly talked about uh, electrical quantum metrology, that's because where I work, uh, but MSL is preparing um, uh, labs and purchasing some equipment to engage in um, uh, quantum metrology also in other areas. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention.